All right, folks, how are you doing? So welcome to Mars, Atlantis, and the Hollow Earth, part three. Disclaimer, copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing, blah, 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 blah. So we're starting off with another Brinsley Lapoire Trench source, Operation Earth. Gods from the North. The ancients believed the gods came from the North and were known as the Dragon or Serpent People. They came from Draco. Furthermore, their spacecraft must have looked very much like fiery dragons flying through the night sky. All over the Earth are symbols, sun disks, swastikas, serpent and dragon carvings. Sun worshippers. Additionally, there is a great deal of evidence indicating that there once existed a great worldwide sun worshipping civilization. Professor Marcel F. Homet, in his excellent books, cites many cultural similarities in South America, North Africa, Ireland, Egypt, and elsewhere. Cromlechs, dolmens, pyramids, sun disks. I actually got that book on the Trail of the Sun Gods. Where was Atlantis? There are too many similarities on both sides of the Atlantic. Where was Atlantis? The National Geographic magazine in 1968 presented its readers with a magnificent map of the Atlantic, stretching for 10,000 miles under the whole length of the middle of the Atlantic. Only a few peaks appear above the water. These form islands, the Azores. The Mahabharata. It is believed, of course, that when Atlantis sank beneath the waves, some of the survivors went underground. The Mahabharata clearly tells us how a civilization destroyed itself aeons ago through the misuse of terrible weapons. This could have been Atlantis. So now we're moving to another source, The Serious Mystery by Robert Temple. Excellent book, by the way. Highly recommend it. And uh, I included this because it's an alternative perspective on the Sphinx, the Egyptian Sphinx, not a lion. I have some observations on the pyramids, on the Giza Plateau, and on the Sphinx. It is often said that the Egyptian Sphinx is a large statue with the body of a lion and the head of a man. I can see no reason for this. There is no mane. There are no prominent muscles in the chest above the front legs as are often shown in statues of lions. The god Anubis. The tail does not have the tuft at the end which lions have, but most telling of all, the rear haunches do not rise up above the level of the back, bulging and prominent. It looks more like a dog's body. Representations of the god Anubis, who was portrayed as a canine, show a crouching animal, the line of whose back is straight like the Sphinx. Celestial importance. To me, it makes much more sense to suggest that the Sphinx was Anubis and that originally he was guarding the sacred precinct of the pyramids at Giza. I believe it is inevitably the case that the pyramid complex at Giza has symbolic celestial importance. Contact period. In my view, there was ancient extraterrestrial contact with Earth, and I believe that the period of interaction with extraterrestrials and the founding of Egyptian and Sumerian civilization between 5000 and 3000 BC, the contact period. I believe the pyramids and the Sphinx were probably built by the extraterrestrials. Amphibious beings. The extraterrestrials do not want to return until we have figured out that they are there. They do not want to announce themselves without warning. They want us to detect them. The Dogon and the Egyptians spoke of a civilization coming from Sirius. The Dogon and the Babylonians agreed on the amphibious nature of the beings who did this. Surrounded by water. My suggestion is, therefore, that the Sphinx was surrounded by water originally and for a significant portion of its history. 
as for how the water got there. The raising of water by simple wooden devices called noris is very ancient and survives today throughout the Nile Delta for much of its history. The bit around the Sphinx was a moat surrounded by water. High civilization. Apparently, there is still some water beneath the Sphinx today, a fact which has puzzled modern archaeologists. To me, there is nothing unusual, postulating that an extraterrestrial visitation was responsible for kick-starting high civilization on the Earth. The visitation to our planet came from Sirius. The accounts are of aquatic beings from a watery planet there. The Hall of Records. If the chambers said to have been discovered by geologists beneath the Sphinx are filled with water, this may be no accident. If it be true that they are filled with indications or records of some kind, as many enthusiasts of the Hall of Records idea believe, it would make sense that aquatic beings would prefer to leave some traces of that kind of in watery chambers, and the moat around the Sphinx might then be done by design. Martian Connection I have mentioned Mars in passing. Do I believe that there was intelligent life on Mars? I would not be surprised at a Martian connection with the Sirius mystery, as I have thought for some years. I have no idea whether the face on Mars in the region of Cydonia is really a face or not, but it looks pretty convincing, doesn't it? Now we're moving to another source, Mysteries, Prophecies and the Hollow Earth by Paul Gorman. The Great Pyramid. How was the Great Pyramid in Egypt built? Luminous beings of Mars originally altered the elements of stone to lift, cut, and place the massive stones in place. Why did they build pyramids on Earth? Half to moor their spacecraft and half to allow the Egyptian kings willing to learn time travel and willing to live in the future an illegitimate and hopeless voyage into mere death. Constructed near each pyramid was a mortuary temple. Also nearby were subsidiary pyramids used for burials of the royal family. Completed helium. Was Mars inhabited by advanced beings at that time? Not advanced, looking for another planet. Why? Mars lost its highly important moons in the large solar mass ejection in that millennium. How did Mars' beings survive? Mars had light beings that needed a lot of helium, Mars' helium was being depleted, and losing the moons finally made habitation of Mars impossible. The moons of Mars. How many moons did Mars have? Three at that time. Were they destroyed by a giant solar flare? Not all were lost, only the most important one that allowed Mars' helium and hydrogen a lower atmosphere. Did they find Earth suitable for them? Not unsuitable. Inhospitable in the amount of helium. Interior Earth. Do Mars's beings ever visit Earth now? Not in spacecraft, only in waves of light. Uh, wavelengths of light. I thought they had checked out the planet thousands of years ago and there was not enough helium in planet Earth, allowing them time to adapt to oxygen and travel on light frequencies to the Earth. I also thought they found another hospitable planet to relocate to long ago. Allowed healed Mars occupants to leave, yes. The non-healed occupants stayed in the interior of the planet. Now, just interesting over here on the on the right-hand side, the blue and the red. If we go back to slide 15, I was talking about the Sirius system. What do you notice on the left? A blue planet and a red planet. Now, if we jump back to slide 22, this is... Um, a screenshot I took from the movie They Live, blue and red, the Sirius system. Yeah, They Live is about Republicans. Mm, yeah, sure it is. Hibernation. What did they survive on if they needed helium? All hibernated over 2,000 years, uh, willingly learning to not be in an atmosphere at all. So they hibernated underground on Mars like locusts for a couple of thousand years until recently. Not on Mars. They are all inside the Earth. Holy cow, that explains the gargoyles and stories of demons. All of them look like animals in the heads and humans in their bodily form. Even if you go to Stirling Castle, you see things like that. 
Egypt and Mexico, the gargoyles, yes, and the demons. They are also depicted in Egyptian paintings and murals. Yes, they landed in Egypt and Mexico originally. Is that why globalist world leaders and even the Nazis were preoccupied with Antarctica? Yes, the inner earth opens to the surface there. Atomic awakening. Do they have advanced technologies? All of the light technologies in their possession are highly illuminating the inner earth. Did our atomic bombs wake them up from hibernation? All of the atomic explosions largely motivated them into action. Memory of Mars. Were the pyramids built during several visits? Yes, not built, but light constructed. I find it curious how sci-fi and popular culture are always about beings from Mars. The memory of Mars is in the DNA of humans. I presume that means all humans. Admiral Byrd. Did Admiral Byrd know about the inner Earth? Not all about it, just the opening to the inner Earth that light came out of. Would openings to the inner Earth let the helium escape? Helium in the inner Earth is lighter than air, so it goes down and heavier gases go up in the opposite physics there. Why are they opposites? Inner Earth forces move outward, keeping the Earth's crust in tension. The outer Earth forces are in compression. Pyramids of Mars. Where did we come from before Mars? Another planet in the constellation Orion. I just saw a picture of a pyramid on Mars that was supposedly taken by a Mars rover vehicle. Are there pyramids on Mars? Yes, there are three buried in elemental dust and sediment. About half of one is not buried, allowing the top half to be exposed. And you can see here on the right, very interesting picture uh, of uh, pyramid alignments around the world and the constellation Orion. So somebody knows where we originally came from and is pretty much spelling it out. So what's this one? You've got the Xi'an pyramids in China, in Mexico, in Egypt, and as above, so below, right? <laughs> so that concludes uh, presentation number three. I really hope you've enjoyed this series. Uh, leave your thoughts and comments below. Welcome all feedback and uh, let me know what you want to see next. Uh, what I'm thinking of doing is a presentation on Osiris. I'm taking notes for that right now. So that'll probably be the next thing that um, I make a presentation on. Or it'll probably be a multi-parter like this one because I have so many sources to talk about. Assyrius and the Egyptian connection and all the rest of it. In fact, I just got a fantastic book, uh, fantastic book today. I say books, I've got several more actually on the way at the moment, uh, but the book I got earlier was uh, Moses and Monotheism by uh, Sigmund Freud, and I've got, uh, I think, about four books written by Manly P. Hall, which are being delivered today. So uh, I've got to go through all those sources. And uh, thanks very much for watching. Take care.